I don't want to say that a carbon tax is a conservative idea, but the idea of using a light touch to address externalities, that's a conservative idea, and that's what leads us to a carbon tax. Welcome to Infinite Earth Radio. We believe that in a world of finite natural resources, a smart and sustainable future is only possible by lifting up people and unleashing unlimited human potential. Infinite Earth Radio will not only help you learn from bright, visionary civic leaders who are building smarter, more inclusive and sustainable communities, but you'll discover how you can bring these ideas to your community. And now, here are your hosts, Mike Hancox and Bernice Miller-Travis. Welcome back to Infinite Earth Radio, where we talk with thought leaders and change agents who are transforming the future by building smarter, more sustainable, and more equitable communities. This is your host, Mike Hancox, and today I'm excited to be starting a new monthly series focused on all things carbon and climate change. Joining me as the co-host for this series is Michael Green, the Executive Director of Climate Action Business Alliance, or CABA for short. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be on uh, on the show with you. Michael was our guest on episode number 27. So if you want to yeah. learn more about Michael and CABA, you can go back and listen to that episode. But Michael, it's uh, you went from guest to uh, co-host. You're, you're on rapidly rising in the podcast world. It's exciting. You know, I, maybe uh, one day I'll be a, a local news anchorman or something uh, covering climate change in the news. Uh, I think this is this is exciting. I'm glad to glad to be here with you guys. And the show so far has just been amazing over uh, over the last year, following the episodes and listening to all the great thought leaders that you've had on this show. I, I really hope to provide just as uh, interesting and engaging content. Uh, and really sparking folks' interest in things that they might have been tracking in the news peripherally, uh, but really giving that deeper dive into what's going on uh, in this ever-progressing world of climate change, climate and energy policy, uh, and carbon pricing. Yeah, m- me too. And I think that one of the things I'm really excited about is we, we really try to focus here, I mean, while we will talk about some things that are happening at the national and international level, we, we really focused on kind of subnational efforts around sustainability and equity. And I know, you know, you've done a lot of work and are doing a lot of work with the states around carbon and businesses. So I'm pretty excited about some of the topics that we're going to be able to dive into over the coming months. It's been really uh, fascinating. Recently, we've actually expanded some of our efforts at CABA to helping state-based networks uh, across the country. And what we were anticipating was maybe five or six states would have representatives calling in and and working with us. Uh, But I think we had something like 29 callers from across 17 or 18 states last week. So it's really a diverse group that we're working and talking with. Uh, Folks that are looking to bolster climate advocacy in states like Arkansas, Kansas, Florida, uh, and then also coming together with people who are already out in front, looking at states like California, Hawaii, Massachusetts. Really exciting. Yeah. And I, over the coming months, I think we've got a list of, you and I have talked about what we would like to do with the show. And we've come up with a list of topics, I think, that are, it's pretty diverse and, and interesting. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. But today we're going to, we're going to get a running start on this new series on carbon and climate change by talking about the carbon tax proposal recently put forward by the newly formed Climate Leadership Council. And the proposal is particularly noteworthy because the Climate Leadership Council is led by a group of prominent former Republican cabinet officials that include such uh, notable dignitaries as James Baker, George Shultz, Hank Paulson. All of those guys were at one point the Treasury Secretary of the United States. And I'm pretty sure Shultz and Baker were um, secretaries of state. And they, I think they've also been um, like chiefs of staff at the White House. So these are very prominent senior government officials uh, from Republican administrations who are stepping out and saying that we, we really need to do something about, about climate change. The elders are definitely stepping out and uh, speaking on this. And I thought that it was interesting to see that even some of the Republican Party uh, candidates who have either looked at previous runs uh, for presidential election, uh, looking at Mitt Romney uh, specifically and others, uh, who were sharing 
the report from the other week on their social media and, and voicing support. It's interesting that the Republican Party may be looking to pivot here on climate change. Yeah, and I think that just to lay out for folks some of the basics of the Schultz-Baker proposal, I use their names because I think there's a lot of Calling it the Climate Leadership Council, uh, there's a lot of climate groups out there, but using Schultz and Baker's names, I think, gives it, gives it some heft. Their proposal is basically to put a tax on all carbon, starting at about $40 a ton, which would translate into initially a tax, what I understand is about $0.36 cents a gallon on gasoline, and it would probably push utility rates up an average of 5 to 10%, depending upon what your mix of sources of energy is. Their idea is they use, have the tax be revenue neutral, and basically people would get a check back, taxpayers would get a check back every year, and they have some talk about sending the check ahead of time, so before the tax kicks in, they would get the first check so that people could use the tax rebate to pay whatever cost they incurred as a result of the tax, and that the average household of four people would receive a check somewhere around $2,000. But then the other kind of basic tenet of the of the program is that the tax would increase every year about 2% over inflation. So if inflation was 2% next year, the tax would increase by 4%. And the idea is then the rebates would increase as long as uh, the tax continued to generate more money. And they think that that would create a virtuous cycle where people would be excited about limiting carbon and taxing carbon because they'd be getting a check. Those are all questions about whether that's effective or not or how that would work, but that's the basics of their proposal. Any any additional thoughts about their proposal, Michael, things that are of note that we should be thinking about? Well, it's certainly something that's not new to some folks within the Republican Party and, and within the conservative uh, think tank space. This is something that former Representative Bob Inglis has, has really championed in the past. And an interesting cornerstone to their policy is that this is an, a clear alternative to current and future climate change regulation. Now, in the past, we may have looked at the trade-off of trading in the clean power plant for a price on carbon as something that we would be extremely skeptical towards. Uh, is the price going to be set high enough? How do we track its progress towards emissions goals? Can you track a carbon tax's progress towards emission goals? It becomes very difficult. Now, right under the new administration, under the Trump administration, it looks like we're going to lose the clean power plant anyways, possibly even bowing out of the Paris Accord. Is that now an opening for us to say, well, what about the trade that we, you know, we might be able to receive? We're looking at this in the Affordable Care Act already, where it started out with uh, repeal, 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 and now it's replace. Could carbon pricing follow the same path going forward with this new administration? Yeah, and I think there's, you know, we'll talk today about the proposal and, and luckily today we're going to get the kind of the conservative Republican perspective on on the tax. I think in the coming episodes, we, we need to have a conversation about how effective would a carbon tax be? How could you structure it so it's not regressive? And there's a lot to talk about, way more than we'll cover in this podcast. But would you like to introduce today's guests? No, that sounds great. So we have Katrina Rourke, Senior Fellow and Energy Policy Director over at R Street down in Washington, D.C. You can find her on Twitter at C. Rourke. Not only is she the Senior Fellow, but she also has a love for soul-crushing dance contests. Uh, Katrina, we hope you can tell us a little bit more about that uh, in today's podcast. But uh, to start off the show, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, and I'll see you on the dance floor. Uh, that's great. Uh, so we're, we're really excited to learn more about uh, the conservative case for putting a price on carbon or a carbon tax. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to jump right in. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, R Street? Sure. And I think that the history of R Street might help to answer that question. So uh, many moons ago, going on five years now, <laughs> R Street was operating as the D.C. office of the Heartland Institute. In the D.C. office, Heartland handled a lot of the issues related to identifying potential reforms to insurance markets and policies that government uses to sort of intrude on those markets in things like crop insurance, flood insurance, coastal insurance. And in all of those markets, the signal of climate change was being digested by market actors and turned into a price signal for risk. 
at the same time that the DC office was handling this, back at headquarters, Heartland was thinking through ways to diminish a belief in the scientific consensus around climate change, let's say. And that was discontinuous with the work of insurance reform and trying to figure out a way to get government out of the business of subsidizing risky behaviors. And so the DC office split off and became the R Street Institute. Uh, and, and that's sort of how this conservative interest in climate change can best be articulated, is there's a market signal. Uh, there's risk that's coming from climate change related to anthropogenic emissions, and we probably need policies to address it. Thanks so much for that uh, history. I actually didn't understand the, the relationship going back, so that's really great to know. And you know, carbon pricing is something that you guys have been following quite closely. That's right. Yeah. So getting it start as, as a, a think tank dedicated to reforming insurance markets, especially insurance markets that digest the risk of climate change, they needed an off the rack sort of proposal, right, mm -hmm. to digest that risk into the marketplace. And as an organization that's dedicated to conservative free market principles, the carbon tax sort of checked the boxes. And so our street has long advocated for a revenue neutral form of a carbon price. Uh, especially one that includes preemption for regulatory programs that currently try to price carbon into the market. No, that's uh, definitely something uh, that we, you know, here on the show have been supportive of and are paying uh, close attention to is uh, putting a price on carbon and a revenue neutral carbon price is uh, one of the ways to go about doing that. And I think a little bit later on, we're going to discuss a uh, different type of uh, what to do with the revenue, whether to uh, rebate that back or uh, look into investment opportunities. Uh, but let's go back even, you got me on this historical kick. So I'm interested in maybe going back further uh, because carbon pricing and the idea of putting a market signal on an externality, that's a conservative idea, is it not? Well, it's certainly a conservative idea to use the lightest touch possible to correct a market failure. So when you look at a role for government as a conservative, you don't want government to expand beyond addressing substantive market failures where the market isn't addressing problems on its own. And climate change is a really perfect example of this. We know that there's risk related to anthropogenic emissions. The market isn't pricing that on its own. And so without the ability to enforce reductions to emissions, I guess, through property rights, right? Mm -hmm. We want to start up property rights. And then that's not working. So how do we address reducing emissions? There should be a role for telling the market that there's this failure. And we've traditionally depended on government to fill that role. So I don't want to say that a carbon tax is a conservative mm -hmm. idea, but the idea of using a light touch to address externalities, that's a conservative idea. And that's what leads us to a carbon tax. So Katrina, we're focused on the We've been talking about the new proposal from the new Climate Leadership Council that the Schultz Baker Group. Yeah, you talk about car, uh, about revenue neutral, and I think that there one of the debates around a potential carbon tax is what to do with the revenue, right? So Baker they talk about a direct rebate to taxpayers. Is, is that the approach that you guys would favor, or is there something you know would you have to take a different approach than they're taking? So you hit the nail on the head. Not every revenue neutral carbon tax is created equal. Uh, and so at our street, we have a different take. One of the main obstacles to getting the carbon price internalized in the market is that it's, it's affecting every corner of the economy, right? So nearly every industry is in some way going to be impacted if we start pricing emissions. And because that's the case, we're going to see economic contraction. What we want to do is use the revenue that we collect to solve that contraction, and we think we can do it by dedicating all of the revenue to the most distorting taxes that we currently have on the books, and those are taxes to capital. So while the a Baker Schultz proposal is suggesting a dividend, our street doesn't think that that's the most conservative idea. In fact, we think it leaves out sort of the crucial part of this situation, which is that you don't want addressing climate change to damage the economy. You want addressing climate change to lead to a more productive economy. Right. Like the Schultz-Baker approach in some ways is progressive, right? It, to some degree, the way they allocate the money to taxpayers might actually be a benefit to lower income or more urban 
taxpayers who may not spend as much on their carbon, if you will. So how would your approach work and how would that be fair to the people who are actually paying the taxes? That's a great question. And that is a tension that's very live in the economic literature around a carbon price. So we know that we'll see economic contraction if we price carbon. And we know that we can best address that economic contraction by targeting revenue to reducing the most distortionary taxes, taxes to capital. But that doesn't get around the fact that a price on carbon is a tax on consumption, and taxes on consumption are certainly regressive. So you do see, I guess, a sticky wicket here, right? How do you promote economic expansion while maintaining the progressivity of the tax code? And there are a couple of ideas. So taking out a portion of the revenue and dedicating it to reducing taxes on work or dedicating it to bolster social support programs in some way, uh, even using it uh, in a form of block grants to the state so that they can best address the regressivity. But we don't get around this, this problem, which is that we want to solve uh, the issue of economic contraction related to pricing carbon. And I want to point out Another problem related to this tension, and this problem isn't just domestic, it's international as well. So we talk about lower income communities being most vulnerable to climate change. And so that makes it even worse if our policies to fight climate change are aggressive, right? I think we can agree that we don't want the like least prepared communities to be hit twice. But climate change also is this funny problem that just makes all of the existing problems we can measure today worse. So climate change leads to water insecurity, which we already document. It leads to trouble accessing sanitation services, which we already document. It expands the range of disease, which we're already having trouble addressing. And so all of these problems that climate change makes worse can be addressed by making people richer, making them better able to deal with these problems. And so while I certainly appreciate wanting to prevent any policy from being regressive, we do want to be conscious that one of our biggest goals here is to make everybody richer. And that's the best way to deal with the impacts of climate change in the future. It's interesting that you bring up the concepts of tax swaps. And there's a thought that's really been championed by the Schultz-Baker proposal, but even prior to that, uh, by your former boss representative, Bob Ingalls that's looking at putting a price on carbon as a trade-off for not just tax policy, uh, but also for future regulation. So one of the things that has really got our attention is if it looks like the Trump administration is already going to roll back and and gut the EPA and, and the Clean Power Plan, is there a leverage point that we have now to say, well, if you're going to get rid of these things, is it also time for a price on carbon? Do you see the administration being kind of prepared for that conversation at all? Oh, Michael, that's a marvelous question. I think if the administration were prepared for that conversation, we would have heard a lot more from the administration about how their meeting with the folks on the Baker Schultz proposal went, which we didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't think, though, that the balance of that answer is going to come from the White House. So we're walking into midterm elections with a Republican in the White House, and we always know that midterm elections are bad for the party that holds the White House. And so what we want to see is the potential for negotiation. And I think that's only heightened by this idea that the majority in the House may be diminished if we have unfavorable midterm elections or that 2018 might not go so well in in getting a greater majority for Republicans in the Senate. And they're going to be looking for ways to differentiate their policies and find opportunities to sort of grow the tent. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that climate change can be one of those opportunities but we haven't really seen it emerge yet because we're, we're spending a lot of time on some other sticky issues at the moment. Well, you bring that. That's a great uh, one of my next points I was going to come away with. Is climate change a populist enough issue for the Republican Party to bite on in this next election? I do think that there's potential there and that there's an opportunity there, uh, especially if they're looking to distance themselves away from the Trump administration. Uh, so you guys are seeing that as well then, it sounds. I always think that there's there's potential for the broad interest in, in climate action to bubble up in an election. But I will say that climate change continues to be one of these red herring issues. And so it uh, polls well, 
The majority of people think that climate change is real, happening, and human-caused. Even the majority of self-identified Republicans believe that to be true. But it's just not on the top of the priority list. And so I don't want to say that we've solved it. This is the way that Republicans will differentiate themselves and, and sort of keep their seats in purple districts. But there's lots of potential you know, if we have a constructive policy dialogue, if we have a dialogue oriented towards solutions rather than finger pointing and blame uh, for that to actually materialize in the midterm elections. Absolutely. And I like that. I like that focus on solutions. So maybe we could just shift shift for a second and talk about the potential effectiveness of a carbon tax, right? So whatever disagreements there might be within the Republican Party, there are a lot of folks on the political left who care about carbon and climate change. And the question I think that arises is, would a carbon tax alone solve the problem? Would it allow for the elimination of the other regulations? And then and then how high would that carbon tax really need to be in order to be effective? I know that the Schultz-Baker uh, proposal starts out at like $40 a ton, but there's a lot of suggestions that you might have to get the prices up maybe closer to $200 a ton in order to have the kind of impact that's needed. So what is your sense in terms of how effective a tax would be? There's a lot to unpack there. So I guess let's start from what the carbon price needs to be to get rid of regulations. Right now we have a whole mess of regulations on the books that attempt to put a price on carbon through these out-of-market signals. So the Clean Power Plan... Uh, that was just one attempt by the prior administration to figure out a way to increase the price of carbon emissions, right? And so if you go through the federal government, through efficiency regulations at the Department of Energy, through automotive regulations at uh, EPA and at the National Highway Transportation Authority, if you go through regulations related to applying NEPA in new ways to address climate risk, all of those carry costs, and they vary from something like a, a couple cents on the dollar to more than $100 a ton for carbon emissions. Uh, I think that there are some regulations that have a price tag that looks like $241 a ton. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, so I might be misremembering. But that that's a broad range. And the funny thing about climate change is that literally every molecule of carbon dioxide that we generate is the same in the atmosphere. So what we're trying to do is reduce emissions across the economy in the most effective way. And we're certainly not going to do that through all of these asymmetric prices on carbon emissions imposed through regulation. So that's one perk of a carbon tax is that it treats every molecule the same. So you set it on whatever industries are covered, and you can get rid of all of these regulations that are frankly a little sloppy in the way they attempt to reduce emissions. But we come back to what the price should be. <laughs> and that is such a fascinating question because you want to think about what the outcome of any carbon policy will be. And I can say with absolute certainty that the outcome of any carbon policy in the United States is not going to solve the global climate challenge. So we can abandon any idea that we're going to do this on our own and that we can ratchet up a price to a level sufficient to mitigating any risk related to disease propagation or sea level rise, that's not something we can do on our own. And that means that any price we pick for carbon emissions is inherently political. And I think we sort of have to accept that political process here and see what that political process will dictate. Now, in this proposal advanced by Baker, Schultz, and Halstead, they say in their sort of collateral material that a price on carbon is going to create a constituency for ever tougher climate action. So they'll start at $40 a ton and they want to ramp it up because they think they're creating sort of a constituency to see those dividend checks in the mail go up. That doesn't seem like the right way to do this because we don't want to create an entitlement, a carbon entitlement with a constituency that wants to see their checks go up. We want to see a policy that reduces greenhouse gas emissions to the point that we're really making it marginal contributions from the North American economy. And so I think that's sort of inherently going to be determined through a ramp rate that has to be established again in that political process. So where you start and how you move the carbon price, all of that is so political 
And I don't think we're going to get the answer from the economic literature, because if we did, we'd have a carbon price already. So Katrina, I think the Baker Schultz proposal proposes like ramping it up at uh, increasing it by about 2% a year above inflation, right? So what I'm wondering is, is, is that a good mechanism or would you, could you just tie the ramping up to the output of carbon, right? So if we had a certain set of goals that like the climate, the Paris Climate Agreement goals that we're trying to achieve, that depending on the rate at which we're getting to those goals, you could ramp up the price of carbon appropriately. So you would increase the price more if we're not getting to the goals and, and not ramp it up if we are achieving the goals. Is that a possibility? Yeah, Mike, that's a really interesting question. And it's something that I've been working with my friends over at EDF on. How do you ensure an environmental outcome from a price signal? It's something that we haven't really done before. And I think what I want to contribute here is just a voice of caution. So we know a lot of things about climate science, but we actually don't know a whole lot about where our energy economy is going. And that means that we, we're not going to have a lot of confidence on an interannual basis about what our like interdecadal contributions will be to greenhouse gas emissions, right? So if you didn't see the fracking boom coming, you wouldn't know that we would be halfway to meeting our uh, clean power plan targets without any carbon signal, right? And we're pushing on innovation everywhere in the energy economy. So states are promoting a renewable energy by allowing people to put rooftop solar on their houses, and those prices are coming down. The Department of Energy is trying to figure out ways to push more interesting technologies to market that the market wants to digest. We've seen proposals from folks like Bill Gates who want to invest heavily in this sector and are you know, putting their skin in the game to make the new energy economy a clean one. And without having any confidence in exactly what those innovation engines are going to deliver to us, why would we have confidence that interannual changes to the tax rate are going to give us better environmental outcomes than just being patient and waiting for those technologies to come to market? I just want to push caution here because climate change is not a challenge that we should examine our sort of eff the efficacy of our policies every five years. Climate change is a challenge where we care about the efficacy over a very long term. And I think confidence in what our carbon policy is going to be will do more to get emissions reductions than this sort of tinkering on the edges of a tax rate if we're, if we're affecting an economy that's much larger than we can possibly understand. Well, Katrina, thank you so much for uh, hopping on the podcast today and joining us and definitely going to be looking for more uh, leading research coming out of our street and also uh, be keeping our eyes out for you uh, cutting a rug on dance floors down in Washington. <laughs> yeah, it was my pleasure. Thanks for talking through these sticky issues with me. Thanks, Katrina. Thank you. So, Michael, that was a great conversation. It was really great to have Katrina here today. And it was a, I know that was a big story in the news, but... I thought we, we were going to try to end each of these episodes with a little conversation, each of us sharing something we've seen in the news that was of interest to us. So what, what was in the news um, other than this Baker Schultz carbon story that, that you would like to share with our audience? Yeah, so uh, the thing that I've been following uh, this week, and you know, I just came back from a little bit of a ski vacation up in the Cascade Mountains. I saw all the beautiful snow and resorts that they had at Mount Hood and uh, in, in round Mount Rainier. And it really got me into thinking about sustainability, the future with climate change, and ski and outdoor sport industry. So on our website, uh, the Climate Action Business Association website, uh, we've actually been covering different mountains across the country that are putting sustainability first at their local resort. So the piece we came out with actually last week was looking at uh, Shawnee Mountain. And we've in the past visited Bolton Valley, Mount Abrams, Berkshire East, Mad River Glen, all small private mountains. And they're taking on climate change headfirst, everything from putting on-site wind turbines, looking at ways they can reduce their consumption through energy efficiency, recycling, on-site composting, and even taking it a step further, looking at the natural surroundings that these resorts take place on and the service that the trees and the forests provide. Uh, so really even looking into 
forest preservation and forest maintenance and what that can mean for the future of these resorts. Now, uh, I can speak firsthand that uh, there's about 20 feet of snow on top of Mount Hood right now, uh, so they don't have any time to worry about it going forward. Uh, but here in Massachusetts, where we had a had a pretty mild winter, it's definitely something worth thinking about. Yeah, it's a huge issue, and I think that's part of the reason. You know, a lot of um, outdoors groups, a lot of outdoorsmen are tend to be a little bit more Republican, and I think that they're very concerned with climate change, both the business people and the, the folks who just enjoy those activities. It's a great way to grow our base and continue conversation with new audience. So the story that hit me, it was a, it's a story on March 6th in Triple Pundit. Uh, it's an online news source. The author is a woman named Tina Casey, and it was about the Alberta tar sands. And it was a great article that really kind of laid out They've approved the Trump administration has kind of cleared the way for the Keystone XL pipeline. And we've seen what's happened up in uh, up in Dakotas with the uh, the camp that's been uh, that was destroyed, the base camp of the protesters that was destroyed. But the, the article really lays out a, a really, really kind of lays out the whole set of issues around the XL pipeline. And, and the pipeline may may still move forward, but there are still some some significant obstacles from the fact that the state of Nebraska, which the pipeline has to run through, has been very opposed to the pipeline and may present an obstacle with the construction of it moving forward. There was also the announcement this week that despite what President Trump said about using U.S. steel, that the pipeline now won't really use U.S. steel. And it'll be interesting to see how people respond to that. But one of the bigger issues is the fact that the, a lot of the oil companies have moved out of the tar sands extraction business in Canada, most of the major oil companies. But the Koch brothers in Koch Industries have moved in as a bigger investor. And what really may, at the end of the day, drive the finances of the pipeline and whether, it's, whether it will move forward and whether it will be successful or not really has a lot to do with, oddly enough, the the weights of different types of oil and the refining industry. So the refining industry in the U.S., a lot of the oil produced in the United States is too of too light a quality to be refined by itself, and it actually needs to be mixed with a heavier product, which is what actually creates the demand for the tar sands oil out of Canada. So it was a great article, really kind of lays out the whole set of issues around the pipeline and, and the potential for it moving forward. And so it was a great article and it was great to see that it the pipeline may or may not still move forward, despite what you're seeing up in, Nor in North Dakota. That's definitely something we've been following closely. I had uh, one of our board members actually traveled to Standing Rock and spent uh, the last eight days uh, while the camp was set up there, uh, helping up with the cleanup. And one of the things that uh, really caught my attention uh, last week was ExxonMobil announced that they're wiping their books clean, um, well, not clean, but uh, to a large tune free of tar sands oil, just because the, the money and the finance and opportunity is no longer there. Yeah. It, it, well, that's a little tricky story about ExxonMobil. So ExxonMobil took it off their books as an asset mm -hmm. because I think there's some financial reporting issues that they couldn't deal with in terms of how expensive or whether that was likely to be extracted. It, it, and they're not currently investing in up there, but they haven't completely ruled out that they would do that in the future. So a lot to watch there and, and a lot to, to keep our eye on. And for the listeners who don't quite understand, one of the real issues is that the tar sands in, it, it's a very carbon intensive process to extract the tar sands as opposed to producing other forms of um, drilling for other and, and producing other forms of oil. So, And to tie it to our guest this week, uh, Canada is moving forward with putting a price on carbon. Uh, so that's something we'll be following and that's definitely going to play in uh, very closely to tar sands development. Michael, thank you so much. It was great. It's going to be great working with you going forward and uh, thank you for being here today. I'm really looking forward to it and I look forward to speaking with everyone in the next month. And thank you all for listening. We look forward to seeing you next time on Infinite Earth Radio. Infinite Earth Radio is a podcast produced by Skio in association with the Local Government Commission. To learn more about Skio, Infinite Earth Radio guests, or how you can make a difference in your community, visit our website at infiniteearthradio.com. Or join us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash Infinite Earth Radio and Twitter by following at Infinite Earth Radio.